welcome everyone. And today we have a next special colloquium of uh, Michał Gańczos. Michał Gańczos uh, finished his PhD just one year ago uh, at University of Wrocław University. He was working on uh, data on the uh, data structures and uh, file compression. And already during his PhD, he was working for Google. Now he moved to Warsaw and he is working for, for Google. Uh, I asked him uh, to give a talk about something which is, I know, under the name fractional bits. This is a new method of compression, which was developed in Poland and it turns out to be very, very effective. And today we'll learn about these fractional bits and probably we have also some general talk about information and bits and compression. So, Michal, the floor is yours. Yeah, so thank you. My name is, as it was said, my name is Michal Gainsor. And yeah, I'm, to, I'm going to talk a bit about this method of compression, but I'm also going to give a broad, broader introduction on a topic. So, I think that everyone, at least in, a, in their life, uh, uh, <clears throat> saw the idea of a bit. The bit is usually the, uh, denoted as the smallest unit of information. On the other hand, we have a data in computer science, and the data in computer science is understood just like any binary sequence. And intuitively, we understand that these two things are different from each other. Information is not data, and data is not, uh, not information. And I think many of us have some intuition regarding this topic. For example, let's take a look at two, two separate examples. We have two pictures here, and we could ask ourselves which is harder to describe. I think everyone would agree that the picture on the right is harder to describe. And assuming that the size of these two pictures is the same, <clears throat> and that is, they have the same number of pictures, we arrive at the conclusion that they have the similar amount of data, but a different amount of information. <clears throat> Let's take a look at a, another example. So as before, I, I assume that everyone can read this sequence. And this is just uh, some couple of sentences with some letters removed. And what was done in this case is that the amount of data was reduced, but it is still perfectly under understandable. So the amount of data was reduced, but the information is the same. Let's take a look at the final example, which is slightly less fun because it involves a bit of math. Let's take a look at the, of all the sequences of length nf made of letters A, B, and C. Yeah. There's, there's extra information which is in your vocabulary in your brain that in the gap. Yeah, that's still not, not enough information to so that's that's another thing which I'm going to talk about later, but thanks for the comment. Okay. If someone has a question, please uh, ask the question to this book. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you can throw it. You can even catch it. Yeah. Um Okay, so consider all strings of length n made of letters A, B, and C. Mm. And are, we are interested in encoding them in a, as a binary sequence in some way. So one different encoding would be, let's say, mm, uh, that for the letter A, we will assign the, the string 0, 0, for the letter B, 0, 1, and for the letter C, 1, 0. And we can encode the sequence A, B, A, C, B as this sequence of bits. Which is, this is quite a naive uh, encoding. We can also look at the separ separate encoding, which is something smart or smarter. We could list all the possible through to the power and uh, strings, and we can assign each string a different binary string, and we can count how many of these strings are. And because there are only three to the power of n, we can take a logarithm of this number. And the logarithm is base two, and in computer science, it's always base two. So if nothing is here, it's assumed to be the base two. And we could assume, uh, 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 we could land with this encoding. So we have some string of letters here, 
and we have the string of uh, uh, the binary sequences, and they are all sorted. Each one is assigned one, exactly one. So comparing these two encodings, one encoding takes two bits per character, and the second encoding takes less than two bits per character. So we have this different amount of data, but we have the same amount of information. Okay, so now the main question is, can we measure somehow the amount of information which, it, which, we, uh, which is hidden in a data? And the answer is, of course, yes, we can, but to do so, we need some kind of mathematical model. And this is the very default model in information theory and in data compression. We have some source which emits a data, and data is just a symbol from, from its alphabet. It doesn't have to be binary. It doesn't have to be binary because this theory was discovered about like, let's say, 80 years ago when the, the, there was no modern computer science. But it stays the same. So we assume that we have a, the sequence. Uh, <clears throat> we have a source which emits a data, which is a, sim, a sequence of symbols from fixed alphabet. And the emitted symbols are represented by random variables. And all of these variables are independent, and I like to stress here independent, not pairwise this, the, in the independent, and have the same distribution. And uh, we can take the sequence of any length from, this, uh, from the source. Um, we would like to measure how much bits of information we get on average or, or on expectancy from a sequence which is taken given from the source. And there are a couple of ways of thinking about it, but the way I like to think about it, that we have some source, we can take some data out of it and see what comes out. And this is modeled as these random variables. So the model is not very complicated. Let's take a look at several examples. We have the source, we have the variable X, which characterize this source. Because as, as I said before, each of these random variable has the same distribution. Um, and if we take three symbols from the source, we see that these three symbols are A, A, B with probability P, A times P, A times P, B. P, A is another, another notion which is very common in the field of data compression. This is just the probability of X being A. And so on, we can have a sequence B, B, B with probability 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7. And we are interested in how much bits of information on expectancy do we get from an element taken from the source. OK, and to measure so, we need to do some kind of information theory uh, measure. and. That, that is the Shannon's entropy. And the Shannon's entropy measures the information for the random variables. So it's defined on one random variable, it, and it is rather a strange sum. In, if you look at the literature, it mostly is in this form. Sometimes it's this form, and sometimes it's this form. They are all equivalent. And it has an inter uh, interpretation, but it's very not obvious inter interpretation that entropy is the expected amount of bits gained by discovering the value of x. So this basically formula says that with probability PA, we will get minus log PA bits of information. With probability PB, we get minus log PB of information, and so on, assuming that the each state's values from A, B, and so on. This is also quite not an easy interpretation. But maybe let's take a look at the example for sample random variables. Um, for, for, for example, what's a random variable? Let's assume that we have a variable x. And it can be its value is either is or lose. And if team A wins over team E, team, team B is win. If team A loses over to team B, it's lose. <clears throat> Let's now look at the examples. If you uh, take a team A equal to Liverpool and team B, team B to Real Madrid, the probability of that A wins is 62%, and entropy is very close to one bit. 
Uh, to be honest, I just took the probability from some website, so I'm not sure it's, if that's correct. Probably some people here think otherwise. Now it's zero because this wave was actually observed and collapsed. Yeah, it's, it doesn't say which, which game was it, so... Okay, you're right. Okay, but now let's take a look at a different example. So we take Liverpool and we take Znic Pruszkov. Yeah, so the probability that it's when is very close to one, and this says that this has entropy of such event has gives us zero bits of information, and this is has a nice interpretation. If someone would tell me that there was a match against Liverpool and Real Madrid, then my next question would be who won. But if my next question, but if someone would, uh, would come to me and said that there was a match between Liverpool and Zinj Pruszkov, I wouldn't have to ask even who won because I already know the result. So we don't get much information out of knowing the value. It's because we already know it. Okay, this is slightly less fun examples of the entropy and maybe not spend too much of but the that's value. Not entirely correct. What you say? Sorry. Well, this is uh, I'm talking from outside, so maybe that's the difficulty. But that 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 example with the Snitch Prushkov is not entirely correct because you are mixing up the first question is the unheralded information, and the second question is the heralded information. You forget about the fact that you, the only reason why the answer is one is that you already learned something before. So you have a lot of information which you receive before, which allow you to give them. And that, that, that's, that's known in the theory of information, that there is a difference between heralded information and unheralded information. Uh, no, you I, I- You cannot compare them both. I, I don't really assume much. I know I know that I know so that you it. know that Liverpool is better than Snitch Pro. Yes. No. So, but so that's in... heralded information. You no you, no wait, the, wait that there. information is not included in your formula. Uh, but this measure assumes that we know the distribution. So it doesn't say that we uh, we don't know the distribution. We have at white talking about the information. The, if I will measure the information, there is a lot of more information in your uh, second example than in the first example, because I can be completely unaware of what means even Liverpool or Madrid, yeah, and be asked. You're, asking, you're yeah. right. Anyway, I was just wanted to make a comment that there are, that these two examples refer to a very different kinds of information. Yeah. You're right, but we're just interested about the information which we get by getting the outcome of X and not nothing, nothing more. Uh, okay, so maybe let's continue. <clears throat> so basically what I wanted to show is this example that the entropy can be any number. It can be zero, it can be number of the, it can be any natural number, it can be, uh, mm, uh, yeah, it, it, it can be fractional, it can be e even less than one. And this is important to know that entropy can be less than one. <clears throat> okay, so back to the source. So now our goal would be to show that we could some, uh, measure somehow the information which we get from the source. And we would like to argue that the n symbols from the source provide 10 times entropy bits of information on average or expectancy. And how do we show that? Mm. So let's take a look at the following game. We know the length of the sequence. Uh, we, know, we know the source, we know the distribution of X, and we know the length of the sequence. So we, we basically take 15, uh, uh, 15 question, 15 symbols are taken from the source. Uh, but we don't know it yet. We, however, know the distribution of X. And we can ask any yes or no question about the sequence to an adversary. And our goal, of course, is to discover S with minimum number of questions. Getting rid of the whole source thing, 
we, ha we just have this game that we have 15 question marks. Each question mark is A with probability 0 0.9 and B with probability 0 0.1. And we can ask any yes or no question about the sequence to an adversary. And we would, of course, want to have some kind of strategy which would allow us to find the S with minimal number of questions. And what question could we ask? We could ask, for example, if first question marks equal to A, which would give us the answer will always give us uh, the information about the first letter. Okay? But Knowing that the, the distribution or the distribution that each question mark is A with probability 0 0.9, we could ask if all first five question marks are A. And this is a bit of a gamble because we, can, we will ask this question. If we get positive number, we will discover all five first symbols. But if you wouldn't discover it, we, uh, but we would get nothing. And what can be shown is that the which I will show in a while, that the optimal strategy needs n times entropy questions, which is not trivial. But the conclusion is that, and this, is, this includes a bit of hand waving here, but if we need n times entropy questions on average, we get n times entropy bits of information on average, which is what we wanted to show, because one answer corresponds to one question. Uh, one answer corresponds to a one bit of information. Mm. But why do we know n times entropy questions? Mm. And this is the reason. The sequence of question, well, let's say take a look at the sequence of question and let's take a look at the sequence of answers. And the sequence of answers and questions uniquely identifies the sequence S. If we know the questions if we, and if we know the answer, we can discover the S. Uh, basically, this is some kind of encoding of S. So this seems like a very similar problem, uh, so, uh, which I, I saw many of you seen before. We saw that basically this is useless data compression, because the sequence of questions corresponds to the compression encoding algorithm, and the sequence of answers corresponds to the compressed data. So these two statements are more or less equivalent that every strategy needs n times entropy questions is equivalent to n times entropy bits is an expected lower bound for data compression. Okay, uh, but how do we show, and this is quite non-obvious uh, non non step, but how do we show that the uh, and throw that this is indeed the lower bound for data compression and it turns out we have a theorem just for this and I'm not going to show you the proof it the, its proof is very it's quite simple uh, to be honest and it's mostly given to students as a exercise take home exercise so uh, and it involves so much so I would math so I will skip it but it, this basically states that for any compression algorithm which is which allows us to get the information, but the expected encoded size is greater than entropy. Okay, so we've shown indi indirectly that n symbol gives on average n times entropy bits of information, which we wanted to show. Mm -hmm. Okay, but this, is, this was quite complicated and indirect algorithm. It introduced some intuitions, and unfortunately, it's like this. If you read about a book about the, uh, the information theory or just go to the Wikipedia page, we, you will see the definition of entropy, some intuitions about this, but not really, uh, uh, not really a clear explanation why the entropy really measures the number of uh, bits of information. Uh, numbers measures the information in the variable s um, okay and there's an also another thing for with those of you who, which aren't fully convinced that entropy is a information measure that is based on the combinatorics for example if you have source which emits a symbols uh, <clears throat> If you take five letters from the source, sequence A, A, A is much less probable than the sequence made of only B. And this 
observation can be summarized. This is the whole proof, which and the theorem is called asymptotic equipartition property. But what's important about this thing is that if you take a look at the source, there are only two to our n times entropy probable sequences. Less of the sequences which can be pulled out of the source, for them the probability is very close to zero and goes to zero as the n goes to infinity. So for such a source, there are only two to the power n times entropy sequences which we care about. Because the rest of them is very improbable. Okay, so let's do a quick recap on the entropy. We've seen that the entropy is the expected lower that information then from learning the value of x. It's a lower bond for the tetron person in some source. And this means that if we achieve the, the, the representation with entropy bits per simple, we achieve optimal compression. That is the representation with the redundancy. We've also seen that the entropy is some, uh, is some uh, <clears throat> uh, combinatorial lower bound. Okay, so previously we were talking about measuring information, but now let's try to concentrate on the optimal representation. Um, and the optimal representation is just we want to have some data, we have to want to have information which is given in the data, but we have to, we, should, uh, we don't re, we basically don't want to have any redundancy uh, redundancy in it. Okay, so how do we do optimal compression? And let's take a look at the theorem which I shown you before, which I haven't shown you a proof for. Uh, for. And if you look at the theorem, mm. apply it for it and equal to one and expand both sides. This is just the code length for the letter sigma, and this is minus log p sigma. And what we get with is that optimal code must use minus log p sigma bits per letter sigma. And this is the property which the code uh, <clears throat> And this is the basically the property which comes from this theorem. Uh, okay, so maybe let's look at the example. And yeah, I mark it here as the most important slide of a presentation because if there is anything to take, uh, to take away from this presentation, it will be probably this slide. Uh, so optimal slow uses compression to told uses minus dot p sigma b to and total letter sigma. But what does, it, uh, what does it really mean? We can think about it that this is our budget per letter. So we, if we have string A, C, B, and we want to have on code letter A, we can spend on it about 0 0.58 bits, because if you look at this value, it means minus log of two thirds, it's 0 0.58. So the optimal code for A, C, B should use about six bits, and so we can calculate the optimal code for CCC, and we suggest that this should use more or less eight bits. Of course, these numbers are not. Mm, let's, uh, these numbers are <clears throat> are not always integers. So we see that somehow sometimes it's hard. Mm. Okay. Mm. So our the role nice is to find optimal code. That is, we want to use minus log p sigma bits per letter sigma. Sorry, how should we interpret that? Given the most important slide. So uh, yeah, C is for a real letter in this alphabet, I would say, mm -hmm. and that's why it's uh, why it's more expensive. Than uh, because it uh, occurs uh, much less, much much less frequent. So if the, okay, so I probably should have said that, but uh, the, if the probability is, if you, we look at the two different letters and we look at the probability of uh, letter A and B, if probability of letter A is greater, we have a, a larger, uh, we have a larger, uh, smaller budget. And th this is that letter A should occur less times this is a uh, letter, letter I should occur less times, therefore, <clears throat> okay, so the other way, the letter I should be more frequent, so we want to have a short code for it. 
letter C is less frequent, so we can have a longer code for it. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, and this theorem which I showed you before basically says the relation which we, which, uh, the budget per letter which we want to can spend on a letter. Mm. Okay. Mm. So our goal is not to find optimal code. We, that is, we must use minus log p sigma bits per letter. And the Ethereum's idea is very simple. Let's take the alphabet as just uh, like uh, like uh, Claudia here mentioned, uh, like in a Morse code. So find per letter code and concatenate the codes. So we want to have separate code for each letter. Uh, and there are examples of such codes. It's for example, half of one, Shannon Fano codes. They both assign sigma code, uh, a code of length minus dot three sigma bits. And this is a sign in here. This is close, but not optimal, because we wanted this value. And here is an example of a Hoffman code uh, for, for some random variable x. And this is a nice example. I choose the probabilities, so they would be, uh, the, 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 this would result in a, nicer, a, a nice example. And basically, if you look at our budget per letter like he, in here, we have we can spend two bits per letter, and we encode it with one one zero uh, one, with a code of length two. And the same here. For this letter, we have a budget one, and this is a code zero. Okay, mm. so this seems like it's optimal. Only the only problem is that this approach fails if this budget is fractional. So we use too much bits to represent B in this case. We wanted to spend 0 0.58 bits, mm. and we spent one bit. So we should somehow find a way to encode B with a fraction of a bit. So it, the main problem now is that if the minus log p sigma is close to zero, redundancy is one bit per character if we use any, any code in which assigns a code to a letter. Uh, one idea is that we take a sequence, we would just partition the string into, uh, in, into uh, equal length, length blocks and replace these blocks with new letters and continue. This, this somehow works. In some cases, it works. It's even sometimes used in practice, the, but this is not a perfect solution. But it's not a perfect solution because the number of possible strings here, the alphabet of B of this, uh, uh, this string on the below, draws very, very large. The another idea is arithmetic coding, which up to date was something which was optimal and uh, and the best what we ha what we had. And as we see, if we have sequence A, B, A, A, it uses all of our budget plus two additional bits at most. So it's optimal up to two bits. Two bits is very small if we are encoding a file which is 50 gigabytes. And how is it work? The idea is very simple. The realization hardly, uh, not, not, not so much. Uh, maybe like the realization of the idea is only slightly more difficult, let's say. And the, but the main idea is to encode whole string sigma one and so on sigma n as a single number from zero one. And this number is written in binary. For example, for ABC, we find a number from zero one and encode it in binary. And that's the whole idea of the arithmetic coding. It's really simple. But if you look at the properties of such code, we, there are quite a lot of them. Each string of the, and they are like that, each string of the, the and the, if you look at the, the details, it works as follow. 
each string of length n will be assigned interval left right from 0 1 and for two different strings intervals will be disjoint excuse me yes zero one is the real range because there's infinite amount of numbers between zero and one so when you truncate the what's the precision you want three digit numbers as did yeah that's it that. here the next point basically so code will be most significant bits of any number from uh, from this interval and we look at the length of this interval take a ceiling of the length of this interval and at one So yes, so we are looking at the numbers with a finite precision. And this interval, the length of the interval is proportional to the product of appropriate p sigmas. So if we set string a, b, a, b, it will hold that the length of this interval is p, a times p, b times p, a times p, b, and the same holds for any sequence. So all it now, is uh, all it now is what is remains is to find the partition of, of the of this interval zero one into distant intervals and the partition is looks like this and it's also not that complicated this is example a is uh, it's is a with probability 0 0.3 and b with probability 0 0.7 Oops, and here is the inter partition of the interval zero one into disjoint intervals <clears throat> As we can see, each string here has its own different interval. The intervals are disjoint, and if you look at the BBB, the, its length is PB times PB <clears throat> times PB. And how do we obtain this uh, partition? We just do some kind of recursive procedure. First, we start with the integer 0, 1. We divide it to one, uh, we divide this to the PA and PB because it sums up to one, so it's easy. In the next step, we partition of in each of the interval proportionally. Yes, so this here, this here are, are, are proportional and so on. And at the end, we end, end up with, a, uh, with the partition which we wanted. Of course, in real life, we don't do this. We don't uh, draw this tree. We just start. We just draw this tree like in. Mm, uh, we, we we don't have to draw the whole tree. Just one path of a tree. So we start with the empty string to encode B A B. We first choose B, and we are now at this interval. Then A. We are now at this interval and B. We are now at this interval. So what it's sufficient to do is to start at the top fifth track of the current interval and and um, keep track of the, uh, of the current interval and adjust it as it's needed. And why do we need this number of bits? It can be checked that if we use this number of bits, to encode the number, which is most likely the middle of the interval which you want to encode, the encoded number may not be exactly this number, but it will fall in the correct interval. Yes, yeah, so, uh, and as we see in the uh, exam example, the, the for a BAB interval is often PB times PA times PB, and if we and if we uh, Plugging this here, we will get that the code is optimal up to two bits. Okay, and the code is also very simple. So assume that we have a number from some interval. We do the basically the same. We start at the top and look if the number is on the right of the tree or on in the left of the tree. If it's on the right, we move right. Again, it's on the right, we move move right. And now it's on the left, it's left. So it's also quite easy procedure to decode the sequence. And here is an example of encoding of uh, letter PAA and the subsequent codes for it. Uh, maybe it's not also worth looking at the whole example, but it's important to note that if you look at the codes here, the third and fourth letter differ. But what does it mean? What is the implementation of this? If this codes 
changed by adding a single letter, that basically means that one bit holds information about more than one letter. So what we managed to do is we managed to encode some a letter with a fractional number of bits, what we wanted to do. And this is another, I, another way of justifying why it works. Okay, so a summary on the arithmetic coding, it's optimal code up to two bits. The, the variants of such code are commonly used in the industry. Downside is that it needs floating point now calculations. Of course, in real life, we don't use floating point cal calculations. Uh, we use other variants, but those variants lose accuracy, so it's like some kind of uh, uh, we get uh, worse compression, but at the bigger speed. It's also worth noting that this is good for streaming. And if you look at the details of such code, we can send part of the code and start the code. We can send a part of the code to the receiver, and the receiver can start the coding. When when he gets the code, he doesn't need to know the whole code. Okay, but the main problem with this is the floating for operations, and the answer the question is: Can we replace them? And the arithmetic coding is to, uh, and the answer is yes, we can. And we can do this also by using asymmetric number systems. Can I ask the question? Yes. Uh, consider, uh, before we go with the floating point and so forth, we have two letters, A and B. Yes. I can write a single string, which is a very meaningful batsa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't contain any other letter than B and A, Batsa, right? And C. What I get in by coding it this way? The word Batsa is by itself a code. Yes, but, but you need to... These letters are used for something. Wait, but the, you know... The, the letters are not objects which exist for some... Okay, so okay. In your presentation, I mean. But uh, okay, so the, I the answered it. The letter, but I the letters have been invented for something, for example, A B C to write the word batsa. Okay, so there's a very a, a simple explanation for this. We want the the code to consist only of zero and ones. We are talking about the computer science after all. And as, look at the example here. We the have computer science. I believe is very useful science. So, I mean, my question is not... Complete. No. Uh, yes, yeah, so if we look at the BAA, how, how would we like to encode it if we wouldn't use bits? We would basically want, need to... Just change. write A and B. But how do you send I mean, it over the computer then? It? I mean, how you define this, these letters? You have to write them somehow. And writing the letter on a piece of paper with a pencil or a chalk or whatever is also a coding. Yeah, but how do you send it over the internet then? Well, by a mail, for example. And how many pixels would that if image will have? Well, we get the, uh, I mean, the Sherlock Holmes has done it. It's written in a Conan Doyle box how to do this. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I mean, I understand what, what you are talking about. But the question is that I would like to understand, uh, 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 at least on a simple example, what I gain by coding the, the simple mm. sentence or a simple word, not the individual letters. Individual letters are basically meaningless. They are used to do something. They are used to send the information. Okay, so as I but stated, no, the point that the alphabet is, okay. is, is a system and writing the words a batsa or tsaba or whatever is also a word of this is a process of coding of a certain information that the old mountaineer is called batsa. So you, I write the batsa, I don't need to explain to anybody else what that means. So the alphabet, the letters are also a code. And we are trying to code a code. Yes, like but, but what, to, okay, so what we are working with, we have a model 
What is to? This is disrespectful. Do you have a chairman? Can we continue the lecture, please? Because I, I'm losing a track. Maybe okay. We can postpone the so maybe uh, let's do the back to the two uh, whether about questions. Okay. So we have an arithmetic coding, but as we see, this uses 14 point numbers, and we have asymmetric number. But on the other side, uh, there was a recently developed code about 2004, which is called asymmetric number systems. And it somehow revolutionized data, data compression, at least in some places, as I will show you later. And the idea of why the idea of arithmetic coding is to encode a string with a single flow point number, the arithmetic number systems encode a string with a single integer. So it's even simpler, right? So if we, the idea is to assign a string some integer x. And the code is simply X written in binary with takes setting of this uh, uh, bits. Setting of the log X bits. Okay. Um, but, and this, this is a very nice idea, but how do we realize it? And uh, the, we realize it, but observing several parts. We still want to use this budget of bits per letter. But if you want to use the budget bits per letter, which means is it minus dot p sigma, mm. then if we can have a code for a string of length n minus one, and we are adding to the last symbol here, we want this difference, this code and this code to differ by our budget. Because if uh, we added a letter, so the length of the code must increase by our budget. But this basically means that if we have a code X for this sequence and the code its prime for this sequence, the difference between its prime and the X must be more or less P. And this seems nice, this one's nice in the arithmetic coding, but now we have integers. So can we do that with integers? And the answer is yes, we can build a similar tree. And we have exact formula for this, and the idea is very simple. We can build the, and what, what, is, what is important about this idea, it does this tree can be built very simply. So obtain left node starting at one, we can use the for this formula. To obtain right node starting, starting at one, we can obtain this formula. And if you look at the ratio of three and 10, this is more or less PA. In this case, it's exactly the, the exactly the, what we wanted. Three to the plan is 0 0.5. And the same goes, uh, goes here. So it's just a, num a matter of uh, finding the right, uh, the, the right numbers, and it turns out they can be found by exact formulas. This is much simpler computation than arithmetic coding. There's, and of course, each string here is assigned a different integer and so on. So of string AA has, uh, is assigned in integer 33, and it's different than any on the, on the other string. Mm. And this is illustration, why does it work basically? Mm. We can look at this tree, look at the left nodes and look at the right nodes. And this is how to, uh, uh, this is the tree linearized in some form. So if you look at the five, if you want to go left, we go to 16, and if you go, uh, go, go right, we go to eight. And if we see, uh, and we can observe that every, approximately every third natural number is green, and approximately every 1.5 natural number is, sorry, so there should be natural here, is red. So we divided the set of natural numbers into green and red numbers. We put a green numbers on the left, left side and the right number on the right side. And this is basically the whole code. Mm. And this is called asymmetric numeral system because green and red corresponds to zero and one in binary system. That is somehow can be called a, uh, that is in some way can be called a numeral system. 
Okay. Mm. But what, as we can see, the asymmetric number, numerical systems are not really perfect. If you look at the cost of encoded letter, they are like this, and it dwarf the note. In fact, they are different my, from minus log p sigma. So we have some error on encoding a letter. The error, however, goes to zero and it goes to infinity. And uh, however, in practice, the edge grows very large, very quickly. If, if you look at this tree, it grows more or less exponentially. And it's infeasible to keep such a, to do such a large, uh, compute, computation of, on large edges. Also, what is a downside, changing phi, phi, sigma, phi sigma in flight is hard. And sometimes uh, during the encoding, if we encoded some part of sequence, we would like to change the probability. This is a bit thin, for example, in the video compression, uh, the, uh, we, we have adapt adaptive coding. And unfortunately, this method doesn't support it. But to have a summary of arithmetic versus, uh, asymmetric, arithmetic versus asymmetric number systems, this, is, this, this the numbers here are mostly my own preference, so don't really think, uh, don't think that this is supported by, I mean, this is su partially supported by some results, but this is mostly my own preference. Uh, what, what I think, let's, let's say it's like this. If you look at the arithmetic, it has a particular compression rate of 10 out of 10, but it is quite slow. With asymmetric number system, the practical uh, compression rate is excellent, let's say, but a bit far from, uh, almost excellent. It has perfect speed. But the thing is that in practice, uh, the implementation of the code differs from what I've shown you here, because we need to do some tweaks. For example, uh, we have to would like to use some, uh, let's say, operation on machine words. So it will be fast to implement. And fast to implement that means just it will be fast if you write it in any computer uh, programming language. In practice, which to use is case to case dependent. But I like to stress here that for many and many application, this one is better because it's faster. And this application is, for example, streaming data, which is a bit faint in the internet right now. Okay, but we have seen optimal codes for sources producing independent symbols. All of these times, we assume that the symbols are independent. This is not true in the real world. And what real life compressors do is they try to handle dependence in some way by clustering similar data. This is, of course, some heuristic. We don't have much proof on this. But there is something to the discrete cosine transform which is used in the video compression, which decorates the data. And the methods which I presented to you are used only as the last step of a compression. So first we take the data, we do some pre-processing pre on it, and then we apply this entropy coding. Okay, it seems like we're getting to the end, but I, I just with one, add one to have the, uh, two slides on more realistic um, models in information theory. The model which I saw shown to you is not very realistic because its eye are independent and you'd like to get this dependence somehow. And for this we have another measure of information, that is we have conditional entropy, that is how much information on average do we gain by destroying the value of x if you know the value of y. And here we have an example. If it's sunny, there's a 50% chance that Bob wears a red t-shirt and 50% that he wears green t-shirt. If it's raining, Bob wears a raincoat. There's a 50% of rains today. And X is what Bob is wearing today. Y is weather today. Mm. Please, I'm a bit rushing here. Um, Maybe it's not worth uh, getting the whole, whole of the sections, but this basically tells us that if we know something about the weather today, we get some information about what, what is wearing today. Because the conditional entropy of Bob, what is Bob wearing today is 
less than the entropy of uh, uh, transition on the weather is less than the ent entropy of what Bob, what Bob is wearing today. And this this way we can define a new model, and this model tells us how much new information we get, which is so, is symbol. Basically, we, if we encode, if we look at the symbol, it's n. We assume that we know all the previous one symbols. Mm, but in practice, this model is too strong, and we to the uh, stage we, uh, we can restrict the model by the stationarity. That is, we assume that this uh, the distribution is stationary, or that the symbols might depend on the, the last three symbols. And the thing why I did it, why I introduced this model, is mostly that we use this model, we can measure somehow the entropy that is the information in these steps. So that is, if you look at the conditional entropy with a condition on the last five k variables, that is the amount of information received by the nth letter if we know k previous letters. k, k equal to five, it's very disputable to be honest, is enough to model the English language. And we can estimate the probabilities of for the random uh, the variables by statistical analysis, and the results will be as follows. So if you look at the entropy of a language, assuming that the letters are independent, we'll get at 4.2, 4, 4 5. But for k equal to 5, we'll get the, that the entropy, the number of information which one letter gives us, assuming that we know previous k letters, is 1.7. But this is basically reiterates what I said before, that there are some, the main challenge in data compression is compressing dependent data. This also gives us a bit of two other remarks, that the standard model is not really not enough to measure the information, and that we choose to use 70% less words, because this seems like a bit of redundancy here. Okay, uh, thank you. This is a slide which, uh, which also lists a bit of the information, the, what, what the information theory also tries to answer, and if it's something is interesting to you, uh, I recommend reading, uh, reading on, on it, because there, this is really quite vast theory, especially lately there is a trend to explain some machine learning problems with the information theory. And thank you. Okay, thank you. So now we have time for questions. Maybe we can start with yeah, a question from the audience. Yes, okay. Oh. Uh, I want to, to ask, because like I didn't really understand the difference between these two codes. Because like when you have an arithmetic code, mm -hmm. uh, you obviously you have to use some bits to encode strings of letters. Mm -hmm. However, bits are also can be thing, thought of like, I mean, they represent numbers. So in, in the end, here we represent string with, num uh, string with numbers, and in the second one also we represent string with numbers. So what's the difference here? Because Yeah, so the difference is here in one we use a floating point number from the zero one, right? So this is a fractional here. And in the other case, we are looking at the integer. So, but like to describe the integer, the number of bits also changes, right? Yes. So, so it's it takes a lot, a sale of lot x bits to describe the integer. And it doesn't take the same amount of bits to describe the floating? It should if the two codes would be, would be optimal. It depends on the encoding, basically. Okay. But you're right, the optimal codes would, in the, and, uh, and in some cases, the, this is exactly the same. Okay, thank you. No questions? Wojtek? Okay. So, uh, what you have shown us is, is starting from uh, one point, which is, I think, very important for all the calculation you presented, which is into knowing the distribution. 
which allows you to compute uh, frequencies or probabilities. Now, I wonder, and I would really love if you could uh, il uh, illuminate this thing to me, what happens if you have a real data? Do you really assume something or you need to scan it once and then compute okay, something? So and then what happens if you have a streaming data? Uh, how do you deal with this real-time situation where you don't know a priori the perfect distribution? And before you answer, maybe I just uh, quickly at the second mm -hmm. small part is, how bad did the things becomes if you assume the distribution of the data of the probabilities actually is not good representation of real data? Yeah, if you the second question very bad. The number the limit is not finite in this case. Uh, but to answer your first question, what is uh, what is happening? You just you you start with the 50-50 percent split for zero for a and b. Let's say. And you count the number which you see over the time. You will you will have uh, over the time. Let's say if you need, for example, thousand symbols, you, you will have a good approximation. And you don't care that in the first thousand symbols who are uh, encoded non-optimally. So you will you update the, the coding as you go. With yes. The data. You update the coding. That's why this. That's why this NNS is not very not good. In, uh, uh, sorry. That's why this NNS sound ANS. Um, uh, this is one of the disadvantages of the asymmetric numerical system that you can't do it easily. In real life, what you do, of course, we, you divide the blood data for blocks, you encode one block, and for the next block, you have different code. Okay, other questions? Um, may I ask a question or two questions? Yes, mm -hmm. sure. Uh, hello, um, I have two questions. One question is, the, the, I think it's a question of terminology. There are no floating point numbers in computers. There are no real numbers in computers. All numbers are mm -hmm. a finite byte representation, so they are all integers, whatever you like to know them, to, to, to name them. Uh, and uh, my, my, my question is the following. This is a certain way a, a, a variant of uh, Lampel uh, Welsh ZIF type of type of uh, analysis for for compression, but you mentioned that uh, what you propose is faster. Uh, what does it mean if you know that all current computers are massive parallel? They have many cores, and you have to divide work between different cores to get real speed up. If you have this, your, your graph, can you, can you split it in the way that you can parallelize your algorithm really to get this advantage? It depends. Uh, okay, so I'm going to answer the question about the, um, uh, uh, the second question. Yes, uh, a lot of the modern compressors split the data. And uh, we have this uh, observed that we uh, if we split the data into several pieces of data, each of the data will be similar to each other. So these distributions will be more or less similar. And this is especially the case for the video compression. And video, in video compression, you can, uh, you can split the word by one thread will uh, encode one piece of, uh, of, a, of a picture, or a picture of image compression. One, one, Code we will encode the one piece of the image and the second one we will encode uh, and the second thread will encode the other part of the image. So, uh, so to, does does, it, does this answer your question? Uh, well, I think we have to stop with that. But uh, can we come to the first one? Because I, you see, okay, first, so... half, first half of this century, that was something which was called commercial codes, which were used for telegraph transmission. Mm -hmm. They had a book. That book has, say, 10,000 numbers from four, all four digit combination. And each combination corresponds to some routine message which could be very long like the sugar will will sh will be shipped tomorrow or the price of rice will rise five percent in five days so so the most often the most often used codes were in the book and there were some codes reserved for names or or names of ships and so on and with that it all worked 
what you are proposing is a sort of on-fly analysis of all those codes, which is very nice, but it is still integer coding. And then you, but you, you, you in a certain way, you have an open-end uh, vocabulary because you are creating new words which, uh, which are longer and longer. Uh, so, um, but you don't have any real numbers, not at all. No. I can, the, the, the standard example in compression course for students is one can always say that writing to symbol pi gives you infinite number of digits. And there are a few other such numbers, but that's, that's rather to demonstrate our problems, not our solutions. Yeah, but um, this is this is a bit of a different. Uh, this is a bit of a different problem. In the computer science, we really uh, uh, work on uh, natural numbers, and if you, this method, which I pre presented here, uses fourteen point numbers, but it can be realized with the uh, with the finite precision. But so, that's still, you have a finite uh, finite string of yes, each, and which yes. is. It is a matter of interpretation. You, you, in computer science, everything is data. It, it, it's 64 or 228 bits can be, can be interpreted as floating point 751 or something, IEEE, or digit, integer or whatever you want. But it is still finite string. Why you call it re, a real number? I mean, it's just a simplification. I, and to be honest, it's an idea of the arithmetic coding. Right? So what I said basically was true. It's a string of an interval from, a, from zero one, and there are continue many of such intervals. Uh, and this is the idea. And the fact that but this idea can- continue means I'm sorry, I, I think that we have to, okay. to finish soon. So this discussion, because it's getting a bit longer, and uh, I propose that it can be after this Official part. Are there any maybe other short questions? Then, if not, uh, let's thank the speaker again.